Will it be the currency of the future? Bitcoin has just hit a record high and is poised to rise even further. But many argue it is only a speculative asset. So exactly what is driving this increase? And could Bitcoin be a new safe haven? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome again to Inside Story from Doha with me today, Peter Dobby. Well, it's Bitcoin season again, the time of year when the world's most famous and least understood currency explodes in value seemingly for no reason at all. In March last year, a single Bitcoin was worth 5,000 US dollars. In December, it hit $20,000 for the first time. As we came into the new year, 30,000. And just days later, it's now 40,000. It has those already on the Bitcoin train guessing at where it goes next, and those who aren't playing a game of, well, what if? We have a panel of experts, of course, standing by to unravel this latest rise for you. But first, if, like many, including me, you're still confused about what Bitcoin actually is and other cryptocurrencies, what they are too, here's what you need to know about the basics. Now, with any type of online currency, every transaction needs to go through a middleman. Now, that's usually, of course, a bank or a money exchange facility. They're the one who says, yes, person A has given money to person B. Cryptocurrency is the name given to any digital currency which allows you to skip that middleman. It does that by a very complicated system called blockchain. That's unique to a few cryptocurrencies and is said to make them safer. All you really need to know is that instead of one person recording the transaction, it is recorded on thousands of computers at once, known as a decentralized system. Bitcoin is simply the first and also the best known version of cryptocurrencies. But there are many, many more. In the last four days, at least 30 others have been created. OK, let's bring in our guests. From New York, we have Matthew Getz. He's the founder and CEO of Block Tower Capital, a cryptocurrency asset investment firm. In London, we have Garrick Heilman. He's a cryptocurrency economist and head of research at blockchain.com. And also in New York, we have John Biggs. He's the editor-in-chief of the technology website Gizmodo. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. Matthew in New York, coming to you first. How high can this go? Yeah, thanks for having me. This is an interesting moment for Bitcoin, for cryptocurrency at large. We look at it from an, the institutional perspective and see this market cycle in the early to middle stages. And what I mean by that is most of these bull markets in any asset class, whether equities or cryptocurrency, they start by climbing a wall of worry and then they move into a part of the cycle that is what I call a trending bull market, where people are looking for good news and data to interpret, and you have real buyers and real demand. And that's where we are right now. And I think a key driver here relative to previous adoption cycles is it's now institutional. And we can talk more about that, what that means, who these institutions are, where the demand is coming from and what they're buying. But effectively, that means we have a long way to go between now and the end of when these institutions finish piling into the assets. And a key transition point that's happened is we've shifted from speculators to these institutional allocators. They're allocating for long term in the space. So it can go significantly higher. People put price targets out. I wouldn't be surprised to see 100,000 or more even in the next 12 to 18 months. Garrick Heilman in London, is there enough updraft in this particular facet of the market? By that you mean uh, momentum to drive the price higher. I mean, I think the answer to that is yes. And uh, one of the challenges with understanding how high the price can go is, you know, Bitcoin is something that's relatively novel. We've seen alternative currencies, you know, in, you know, arise in the past, but you know, this is the first decentralized digital alternative currency or asset that we've ever uh, seen grow to this size. And monetary assets, by nature, are difficult to value. Uh, they're valued based on supply and demand. You know, a lot of people reference gold 
and, and Bitcoin has earned the, the uh, nickname digital gold. The size of the entire gold market is 10 trillion. Bitcoin today is worth less than 1 trillion, about 730 billion roughly at present. Many people think that Bitcoin, which has more functionality in many ways than gold and, and has a, a, a tighter scarcity, will actually surpass and eclipse gold's total market value at some point. When that could happen is anyone's guess. But a big part of the story in Q4 is Wall Street investors and others rotating some of their gold allocation out of things like gold ETFs and into Bitcoin. That's uh, something JP Morgan and other banks have observed and talked about. So that's, I think, a big part of what's driving the price right now. So John Biggs back in New York, uh, if institutional investors are rotating away from traditional safe havens like gold, does that mean that the rest of us should be, I'm not wishing to get you to breach any kind of insider trading legislation, but no, no. Sh should we be buying Bitcoin? Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, what these guys aren't saying is that they don't know why the price is so high. They'll give you all kinds of, uh, they'll give you all kinds of fascinating information, uh, but most of this is basically the hype cycle. At this point in the game, I mean, you're looking at an investment of 40k for the average person that's almost impossible so maybe you could buy a little bit you could try it out you could see what happens but unless you're unless you're an insider in this game at this point we've pretty much reached the point where you can uh you can make your millions um i've there are there are people out there who have made these millions but they they invested in 2010 early on and because this has no real bearing on reality aside from maybe a political connection uh, libertarians are putting their investments into into crypto because it seems like a good place to go. Uh, there's really no bearing on reality of what's happening here. So this market is completely uh, is completely um, fantastical. Matthew, back in New York as well. So explain to us why these institutional investors are thinking it's the right place to be. Because according to John, also in New York, it absolutely is not. Yeah, I love a, I love a good debate and appreciate the comments, John. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll take the other side of that pretty pretty strongly. So, uh, I came from the institutional world. Uh, my co-founder was a portfolio manager at a university endowment, and the thesis was institutions would ultimately end up investing and allocating to this as a new asset, as a new asset class. Early on. John's right. You know, there were engineers, there were technologists, there were early adopters who got into the space five, seven, ten years ago. While it matured, while the industry matured, while Bitcoin matured as a financial asset, which it very much now is, the market structure, the market infrastructure is there. Now you have institutional demand, and he and he, and, and John mentions it's not based on anything real. It's based on very real things. So one thing that happened in 2020, for example, if we look around New York, if we look around the US, if we look around what institutions, companies, people, investors faced, what they internalized in 2020 is a pretty dramatic shift. If you think and look at the macroeconomic backdrop, you had a moment in March where uh, risk assets completely fell out of bed. And then we experienced a K-shaped recovery. You had Wall Street and stocks delaminate from their underlying fundamentals. And you saw the performance of various stock markets, of the NASDAQ, of big tech, et cetera, last year. Matthew, can I interrupt the you there you had... and just pause you for a second, for which I sincerely apologize? A K-shaped recovery, assume I'm a complete idiot. What does that mean? And when you talk about investments delaminating, in a sentence, give me a sense of what that means as well. Sure. Yeah. So K-shaped recovery, meaning Wall Street stocks went one direction, i.e. up. Uh, but the reality, the underlying fundamentals for people, human beings, their livelihoods, small businesses, as has been well documented throughout the pandemic, experienced in many ways a very different reality. The reaction to that uh, from central bankers, from the Fed here in the U.S., was stimulus, what was more money printing than had ever incurred in history. I think it's something like 30% of all US dollars that exist were created last year in okay. 2020. Okay, let, let, so, me, let me just take that idea of 
inflation and I guess you would call it quantitative easing, which is basically printing money to put money into the system mm -hmm. as a stimulus. Uh, Garrick Heilman in London. Can this cryptocurrency be a hedge, a defence against inflation when you have governments around the world anticipating uh, a recession, maybe tipping over into a 1922-style depression where they have to start printing more money to get it into the system because people around the world, because of COVID, we haven't seen this many people losing their jobs this quickly for a long, long time. The short answer is yes. So even before the pandemic, uh, many were concerned, myself included, about the unprecedented level of debt, uh, world record levels of debt, uh, on the public sector's balance sheets, on government balance sheets, in the private sector and elsewhere. And with the pandemic, that uh, debt picture has only worsened. And historically, uh, hard assets, traditionally gold, but also real estate, other scarce, difficult to mass uh, produce assets and stores of value, art, have done well during periods uh, of inflated uh, risk of a financial crisis. And Bitcoin, as we have argued uh, in a blog post titled, uh, the world's hardest asset is ironically virtual, uh, that being Bitcoin, is, is in many ways superior to gold because it has a capped supply. And this is digitally, algorithmically scarce in a way that gold can never be, or anything uh, physical uh, that, that, you know, in theory, and Elon Musk could go mine more gold one day uh, in the Mars uh, asteroid belt. Uh, and, and, and so this algorithmic scarcity is very attractive for people who are concerned about more money chasing the same number of things. And you see it in stocks, you see it in real estate, uh, you see it also with crypto assets like Bitcoin. Uh, asset prices are going up as this wall of stimulus and, and money printing uh, is occurring. And, and you know, I, this is a not to, 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 to criticize that effort. People are in, in serious trouble in many parts of the world. And some stimulus is, is, is certainly warranted. It's been a bipartisan effort in the United States and elsewhere okay. to support. OK, people. John Biggs in New York. If there is to be a course correction in this upward trend with this particular cryptocurrency, indeed with any cryptocurrency, what will the course correction be? I mean, what will be the spark that leads to the course being corrected? Course correction in what way, I guess, is the question. Are we talking about economic course correction? I mean, the, the only people that are saved in their proposition are essentially three folks on the, on the TV, and I'm, I'm assuming that you don't have any Bitcoin. So they're suggesting that because if we hit a uh, 1922 depression, that Bitcoin is going to pull us out of it, there are going to be companies that will survive. There will be companies that are, that are managing it, that have invested in it. Uh, and assuming, this is assuming, and this is a big assumption, that it stays up in the 40Ks, even to 100Ks, then those guys will be fine. And yeah, we're going to flip into a new era, which every turbulent era does. Uh, you lose your, you lose your um, uh, Dale Carnegie, you, you lose your Carnegie's and you get your uh, JP Morgan's after each one of these things. Uh, so we're in this, we're in a very uncertain period right now. But has the U.S. government invested very much into Bitcoin? No, they have a little bit, I'm sure, uh, but they're not talking about it actively. Has any government out there uh, changed their entire uh, gold hoard uh, to something, uh, to virtual currencies? Absolutely not. It's not a, uh, it's not a, um, sure, it's institutional, but it's definitely not political. It's definitely not governmental. Ah, that's, that's the key thing. Let's go back to Matthew in New York as well. Matthew Getz, is that part of the appeal for all investors in cryptocurrencies? To pick up on that point that John Biggs was making, it's not linked per se to a central bank. It's not linked, therefore, to the US dollar. So it's not linked to the Federal Reserve. It's not linked to the euro. It's not linked to any of the, the lower down the food chain currencies. Therefore, it's not linked to any president or prime minister or any finance minister anywhere in the world who can talk to a central bank and govern, literally govern, economic policy. Yeah, th those are great points and all ones, Peter, that I, that I would have made. You stated them more eloquently than me. So, so on the back of John's comments, 
Yeah, that's actually part of why this is bullish, right? You have waves of adoption and market participants who come in over time. First it's the technologists, then it's the high net worth individuals, then it's the, you know, venture capitalists, then it's the then then it's the, you know, family offices and now the institutions. You have public companies buying it on their balance sheet in the US. You have insurance companies like Mass Mutual, that's a 169-year-old massive insurance company buying it in their general account. So the next wave of this is going to be more of those, more insurance companies, more public companies. Ultimately, it will be sovereigns and governments who are buying this. Um, that is the direction this is all headed. That's what makes it asymmetric uh, and helpful to people. Um, and 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 to the point, uh, Peter, that you make about it not being linked to a fiat currency like the dollar, the euro, the yen, uh, that is part of its value proposition as well. Because as we're seeing with the Fed and the expansion of the monetary supply, if you leave your money in the dollar, you're going to lose half of it over the next five years with the rate of monetary expansion. So when you have a hard asset, like Garrick was mentioning, like Bitcoin that has finite supply that can't be inflated away by a politician, a central banker, a CEO, right? If Tesla goes up 10x, what's Elon Musk going to do? He's going to print more stock. You can't do that with Bitcoin. It right. is the okay. hardest of hard assets. Okay, because that's in effect, you, in effect, what you're saying is it's a finite asset and that's why it's a supply and demand issue. John, John Biggs in New York as well. What do you say to those people who say these cryptocurrencies are a great idea? And they say they're a great idea because their logic, some of their logic says this. It means that money, in inverted commas, can be fairer in the way it's used by the people who use it. So that's why certain administrations in the West Indies are experimenting with this. And if you look at the continent of Africa, where a banking system for a lot of people simply doesn't exist, their mobile phone with an app becomes their banking system. So you can live in a poor country, and I'm putting that in inverted commas, or a country that has little slash no infrastructure, but you can still do banking and in effect live in a cryptocurrency world. Well, so, so I think let's let's talk about that first point. I mean, you can still do banking, and and the and the banking doesn't necessarily have to be connected with any sort of cryptocurrency. My my view of the cryptocurrency, and I think I think they said it. I think the the other two guys said it best when they basically said, "Look, who owns this right now? It's uh, it's the early adopters, technologists who know exactly how to hold it. You never want to hold it onto any online wallet. That's the first trick. So they know exactly how to hold it without getting robbed." Uh, they also know how the, the institutions know how to hold it now. So and uh, and presumably the governments are eventually going to know how to hold it. But the average person doesn't know how to hold it. So there's really no there's really no benefit. So you're still using a middleman. The goal of this whole process, the whole system, uh, Satoshi's original vision was that this was going to be a democratized, completely decentralized banking system that anybody could use. It's not. It's it's really really difficult to use. You can get wrecked in seconds. And yeah, maybe it's going to go up to 100,000. You're going to invest at, at 99, and you're going to go. It's going to go back to 97. You're going to lose. Uh, so the same thing is the same thing as the dollar is true of the Bitcoin. Uh, but for that banking person, that person banking in in Africa, or the person banking in a developing nation, uh, there's there's plenty of systems in place and plenty of systems available that you can you you can do exactly that without using cryptocurrency. Uh, there's plenty of remittance systems that don't use cryptocurrency at all. And actually, all remittance systems don't use cryptocurrency at all. Okay. So we're in a position to say that this, this is a brand new technology that's helping the world, but it's not being used at all. Nobody is using it. Okay. Uh, Garrick Heilman in London, on that idea of it's a brand new technology that's not being used properly that, that John was talking about there, does it need to be regulated? And that's a problem because governments, financial ministers around the world don't really get it in as much as... With all due respect to you three, there is little or no moral compass in the world of stocks and shares. Hopefully, there's a big moral compass in the world of politics, and it needs to be regulated, if only because a guy called Gerald Cotton, a Canadian, died in 2018, and he, in effect, took $250 million of other people's money to the grave with him because all their invested money was password protected. And hello, he was the only guy who had the password. Right. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to say there. Uh, you know, first, 
this is uh, regulated currently, and, and part of the story of 2020 is, is there's been much greater regulatory clarity around crypto assets, particularly in the United States, and that's helped get institutional investors and banks more comfortable uh, banking crypto and crypto companies and supporting customers, the growing, we estimate roughly between 50 and 100 million uh, owners of crypto assets like Bitcoin today globally. Uh, you know, so it's still you know not a billion users like uh, WhatsApp or, or another major tech platform, but it's it's grown significantly. Um, but your points, it's fair. Look, I mean, I think people listening to this they need to understand that crypto assets have historically been quite volatile. You know, in March of last year, we saw the price drop 50% in one day. In 2018, Bitcoin's price went down over the course of the year roughly 80%, and that hasn't been um, that uncommon historically. Uh, so, so for people who are living kind of paycheck to paycheck or day to day, uh, you know, they need to be aware of not only that volatility, but also the complexity of using this technology. Uh, it is uh, a new technology. There is a learning curve. There is a need to educate uh, regulators as well as everyday folks who are not early adopters or uh, that tech savvy. Companies like blockchain.com work really hard to try to do that, but it's a, it's a daily challenge. You know, it's not something that by any means we've mastered. It's getting easier. It's uh, you know uh, something that you know is going to take years, if not decades, to kind of transition the world to this new financial rail, uh, financial infrastructure that blockchain technology and crypto assets represent. Okay, um, let's go back to Matthew Getz in New York. One thing that strikes me as being genuinely worrying over the past what three months or so, the Bank of America seems to have adopted an attitude that says, and I quote. Cryptocurrencies blow the doors off prior bubbles. That seems like a big banker's way of saying, we just don't know. And if a big banker or a big bank doesn't know, surely that means the risks are just too great. Yeah, as someone who came from one of those banks, uh, it's really interesting to observe you know, the statements that are made at one point in time and how they transition, capitulate, change over time. Uh, I, I think that may be a, a slightly hyperbolic way of saying, we don't know how, how big, how high this is going to go. And I think that's fair. I think anyone who purports to know that um, probably isn't someone that you should listen to. Uh, but I think what we have seen, and this is a pattern that has repeated in every bull market and every cycle that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency have gone through and it's now 12 year history is you have a new wave of adoption and market participants come in that pushes the market up to a local bubble, a local high, right? That happened when Bitcoin went from $1 to $100 okay. and then it consolidated. Right. And, and then it went back up and it got to $100, and people said what Bank of America okay. is saying now. Okay. And what did it, what it do? It went to $1,300. Okay, so Matthew, I'm going to pause you there, because I, I just want yeah. to put one final point very briefly to John Biggs. John, in New York, in 30 seconds, the reality is somebody watching this discussion might say, oh, I'm going to put 20,000 US dollars into Bitcoin. But the reality is the same with this as with any other investment. You should only invest, surely, John, what you can afford to lose. This may be a virtual currency, but however, it is really taxable. So if you make a profit on it, you've still got to pay tax on that. It's, it's currently taxable. And if you buy 20,000, you don't keep it on an online wallet like blockchain, you put it in a hardware wallet, and you have to understand exactly what you're doing. You become your own bank. And it's actually fairly difficult to, to do all this stuff. And you can be hacked instantaneously. Uh, so anytime you deal with this stuff, it's very dangerous. That's why I don't like to recommend it right now, because it's just, they, they say that the rails, are, the rails are brand new. They're 12 years old. I think uh, WhatsApp's 12 years old. It's even probably even younger. And I can, uh, I can send a message pretty quickly. It's, a, uh, it's fairly frustrating to, uh, to hear the same story from these guys over and over again. You can be hacked instantaneously. That's genuinely frightening. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on Inside Story. Thank you to our guests. They were Matthew Getz, uh, Garrick Heilman and John Biggs. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime via the website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Inside story from me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye bye.